Hello! When we were exploring the set of solutions for linear differential equations, I hinted that homogeneous equations are actually easy to solve. Let's see, that's the topic for this lecture. We start with the key structural theorem. We are trying to find all solutions of a given homogeneous equation, and the theorem claims that it's a linear space. What does it mean? Well, it means that if I want to know the space, it's enough to find some basis. So I'm looking for some functions, y1 through yn. How do I know that I need n of them? Because that's the statement at the end. The space has dimension n, the same as the order of the differential equation. So I'm looking for n functions that would solve my differential equation, which is homogeneous and linear. and there would be linearly independent. And that's enough. We don't have to test that they span the set of solutions because we know that we need n of them. That's another of those tricks from linear algebra, saving our time. So this is the key moment. We need to find a basis. And because basis is so important, people in the differential equations field actually introduced a special name, a grandiose name, wonderful name. Let's have a look at it. It's called a fundamental system. When we are given a linear differential equation that is homogeneous, we can look at the basis, pick any basis, and call it fundamental system of solutions. This really sounds great, doesn't it? Much better than basis. Okay, so we're looking for some fundamental system of solutions. And when we find it, it means that through this system we can reach any solution. We can reach them in the form of a linear combination. So when we form a general linear combination, let's say C1, Y1, plus, and so on, Cn, Yn, we get a formula which captures all solutions, and therefore this would be the general solution. On the interval i, everything is done on some interval. Let's have a look at an example. We have an equation, y double prime minus 3y prime plus 2y is equal to 0. A very nice, linear, homogeneous differential equation. I claim that the set e to x, e to 2x, is a basis or a fundamental system. I really mean a basis, okay? It sounds better, but when you say basis, people generally know what you mean. So, what do I have to do to convince people, for instance, the audience, that really the set e to x, e to 2x forms a fundamental system? Well, typically when people say, how do you recognize a basis? Then people think of two conditions that have to be checked. But in fact, there are three conditions. Not two, three. What is the third condition? The one that people often forget about. But it's very important. Well, if these guys are supposed to form a basis of the space of solutions, then in the first place they have to belong there, because if something does not belong there, it cannot be a basis. So the first thing to check is that these guys actually solve my differential equation. Let me call it star. How do you check in the easiest possible way? You simply take this candidate, you put it into the equation, and you see what happens. You put the exponential there, and all the derivatives just leave it alone. So there is exponential, exponential, exponential. There is one of them, plus two is three exponentials, minus three is no exponential. Yeah? It yields zero. Okay. Let's do it for the second one, because there it's not all that obvious. So what is the second derivative of e to 2x? Well, the first derivative drops 2 down, another derivative drops 2 down, so it's 4 e to 2x minus. 3 times derivative. The derivative drops 2, multiplies by 3, it's 6 e to 2x. And finally, I'm adding 2 e to 2x, and when you look it out, work it out, you get 0. Yeah, checks out. So that's the first condition. 
the second condition, those functions have to be linearly independent. Linear independence. How do you prove it? Well, in this case, probably intuition would be enough. Linear independence means that it's not possible for one function to be just a scale multiple of the other. Can I take e to x multiplied by a number and obtain e to 2x? No way. So this is obvious. But of course, things which look obvious in mathematics are dangerous because perhaps we are wrong. So let's do it properly. We have to ask ourselves, is it possible to create a non-trivial linear combination of these two guys which actually yields zero. Let's have a look. This is a linear combination of these two guys. It creates a zero, and we are asking, OK, if we put zero for alpha, zero for beta, we get it. No problem there. But is it possible to get it also in some other way? That's the key question. Now, we have to remember, this is an equality of functions, which is happening for x living somewhere. Actually, I didn't say where. So I was a little bit sloppy. I should be saying here, when I said it's a fundamental system, I should say where. Well, let's see. There is no problem in the equation, no problem with the functions. Let's be courageous. Fundamental system on R. When I was checking that my equation was satisfied by e to 2x, was it true for every x, every real x? The answer is yes. So in fact, now we are making it proper, finally. So this equality is true for every x from real numbers. Now it fits. And here I have to say, OK, let's assume that this is true for any real number. Is 0, 0 the only possibility? And again, you can say, oh yeah, it's obvious. Or you can start wondering about uh, actually working in some, out somehow. So for instance, what if I put 0 for x? If this is true on the real line, then definitely it must be true for x equal to 0. And I'm getting alpha times 1 plus beta times 1 is equal to 0. And I have a nice algebraic equation. Well, this looks like a nice idea. So why don't we try 1? I put 1 for x, and I get alpha e plus beta e squared is 0. Well, 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 what can I do with that? I can divide the second equation by e. Alpha plus beta e is equal to 0. And I can start thinking, what if I take the second equation and subtract the first one? This looks like an interesting idea. If I do so, alpha cancels. I can factor out beta. And I get beta e minus 1 is 0. Now, e minus 1, that's a non-zero number, definitely. And therefore, beta must be 0. And from the first equation here, alpha must be 0. So we have just shown that if we form a linear combination of my two functions, which yields 0, then the only way, necessary way, is to put 0 for alpha beta. And this confirms linear independence. Yeah, we got it. The third requirement for proving that something is a basis is flexible. We can show that e to x, e to 2x generate all solutions, but this is hard to do because we don't know those solutions yet. So we try the second trick from linear algebra. This is an equation of order 2. Therefore, the space of solutions has dimension 2. And we have two functions. This fits. So the basis has the right size, so to speak. Yes, we have a basis. What does it mean that we have a basis? Well, over here we can see what it means. It means that we can write down general solution of our equation. And the general solution reads, y x is equal to, let's say, a e to x plus b e to 2x, x belonging to real numbers. And we are done. We completely solved this homogeneous equation. So once we have a basis, everything is easy. The tricky part is proving that you have linear independence. We did some tricks with substitution of x, but you can imagine if your functions are less friendly, this could get complicated. There is a general way 
to check that the set of functions is unilaterally independent. Uh, there are some assumptions which actually are not too restrictive because they exactly fit our situation. Let's have a look at it. So, first we have a definition which sets up an object. We have n functions which have at least n minus 1 derivatives, which is, by the way, true for our functions in the solution set because they solved linear differential equation of order n in our situation. But here we do not talk about solutions yet. We just have functions with many derivatives. And now we form a matrix. Now notice that this is a matrix, and those bars that are flat, so actually it's the determinant of a matrix. So we form a matrix, and then we find the determinant. And in the matrix, in the first row, we are just substituting into those functions. In the second row, we are substituting into derivatives. And in the third row, into the second derivatives, and so on. Or you can see it this way. You take your function, you differentiate it many times, and you create a column in this matrix. And then you create the second column from the second function, and so on. By the way, we used exactly the same trick, the same point of view, when we were proving uh, dimension of the solution space in the previous lecture. So, there is some coincidence. I don't want to talk about it too much. Here is the key statement. We have a homogeneous linear differential equation, a formula which is familiar by now, and assume that the coefficients are continuous. This is what we need for existence of solutions, things like that. I mean, without it, nothing works. So, this is a natural assumption. And we have some candidates for a basis, functions y1, y2, through yn. So there is the right number of functions, that's important. And there are solutions of this equation on this interval i. So we actually have condition number one satisfied and condition number three satisfied, the right number of functions, and they solve our equation. And the statement says, we create a Wernicke n, which is determinant of a matrix, so it's a function again. And when we create this Wronski n, then using this Wronski n, we recognize independence. Independence happens when this Wronski n is non-zero. And actually, there are two conditions which are equivalent, and they are surprising. Typically, we say, OK, Wronski n is not zero anywhere, everywhere on i, but it's enough to check on just one location. And if for this one location, Wronski n is not zero, then it's not zero everywhere. This is not true for general matrices, but it's true for matrices which are coming from solutions of a differential equation, of common differential equation. Okay? So there are many special things happening. This theorem is definitely not easy to prove, but it's a way to recognize independence. Let's have a look at our situation. So, in our case, the Ronsky determin uh, determinant, or Ronsky n, is the determinant of a matrix where in the first row I put my candidates for the basis, or the fundamental system, and in the second row, I put derivatives. And now, when we are calculating determinant for a two by two matrix, this is very easy. We just multiply the diagonal, and we subtract the product on the other diagonal, so to speak, uh, like that, and we get e to 3x. Could it be zero anywhere? The answer is obviously not. This is not zero on R. And we know for sure now that these two guys are linearly independent. So this is very flexible. And not just that, it can be actually used in general settings, for general functions using some knowledge about them. And that's exactly what will happen now. We will incorporate this Ronsky into theorems, so we will not have, to, not have to worry about it. We will just develop procedure for finding a basis, because that's what we need now. We need a basis. Where do we get basis for a homogeneous linear differential equation. Somebody gives it to us. Where do we get these guys? Once we get them, the rest is easy. Okay, let's have a look at another slide. The sad truth is that so far we were looking at linear differential equations where the coefficients could change. That was a very general point of view, and all the theory worked. But once you start looking for fundamental system for a basis, uh, we are no longer capable of doing anything in full generality. So we restrict ourselves to examples like that, where the coefficients are just constants. So there's, a, let's say, terminology. These are called linear differential equations with constant coefficients. 
Actually, it's just plain English, isn't it? So just a little terminology here. Here it comes. And this is still not a theorem, so we have some preparatory steps. We are given differential equation. It's linear, it's homogeneous. Now notice that those AIs or AKs, whatever, the coefficients, they no longer feature x. We are emphasizing now their constants. And we are creating characteristic polynomial. Let's try it for our example. How is this characteristic polynomial done? You look at your differential equation, you look at your derivatives, and here it's actually zeroth derivative. And then you replace every y to some derivative with lambda with the same power. So here you get lambda squared, here you get lambda to power 1, and here you get lambda to power 0. Lambda is now just a known number. Lambda square minus 3 lambda plus 2 is equal to 0. So that's the characteristic polynomial for this equation. Now with a bit of experience, which means you do it about once and you are experienced enough, you can pass from a linear differential equation with constant coefficients to characteristic polynomial in one go, easily. Then you find solutions, roots of this characteristic polynomial and these are called characteristic numbers or eigenvalues of this equation. So what are the eigenvalues of this equation? Let's have a look at it. I have an equation here. My favorite way of solving it is factoring because for school problems this usually works. School problems are assumed to have nice solutions. That's the difference between school and real life. In school everything is nice. Although sometimes it doesn't look that way. Anyway, here we go. My attempt at factorization. 2, how do I get 2? As 1 times 2. How about the signs? I need to get minus 3 here. Minus, minus. Does it work? L square minus 3L plus 2. Yeah, it does work. So I just found out that the characteristic numbers are 1 and 2. Now, interestingly enough, the fundamental system that we have been looking for is e to 2x and e to 1x. e to 1x, e to 2x. 1 and 2. Is that a coincidence? The answer is no. That's not a coincidence, that's exactly what we've been looking for. Here is the key statement. It's so important that it deserves to be called a theorem, but the proof is so simple. Uh, okay, we'll see. We have a homogeneous linear ODE with constant coefficients. We find characteristic numbers, which we just did. And when we create an exponential out of this characteristic number, then it must be a solution of this equation. Wow, that's perfect. Let's prove it. This is important. Proof. We are claiming that the exponential function is a solution of some equation. How do we recognize? We simply substitute. So here we go, full proof. Lambda naught is a characteristic number. And we check on y, let's say y0 is equal to e to lambda naught x. How do we check on this function? We substitute into the left hand side. What do we get? Well, we have to differenti differentiate it n times. Then there is a summation k going from 0 to n minus 1, a k, and then there will be the kth derivative of e to lambda naught x. Let's see. Now, students can usually work out this, but if it's a little bit overwhelming, it actually helps to write it down in the long way. I'm generally trying to avoid the long way because it's long, but on the other hand, it sends a very good message. So let's have a look at it. What message does it send? So, okay, what is the second last term? It's a1 and the derivative of our exponential. And the last term is a0, our exponential. Now let's see. Okay, at the end we have a0 and the exponential. What happens here? Here we have derivative of the exponential, which means that it stays there and lambda0 drops down. So it's a1 lambda naught e to lambda naught x. 
Then, in front of that is the second derivative, so lambda naught drops down with lambda naught squared. A2, lambda naught squared, e to lambda naught x. And we keep going like that. Then we get here, and n minus 1, and there we take n minus 1 derivatives, and each time lambda naught drops down. So it will be to power n minus 1, and then there will be this exponential. And finally, here we differentiate it n times. And now we look at it and we say, okay, okay, well, 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 uh, I can factor out this exponential. It's everywhere, so let's get rid of it. What do I have left here? Uh, actually, just one. Uh, sorry, lambda naught to power n. Then, a n minus 1, lambda naught to power n minus 1. Then, we keep going. Then there will be a2 lambda naught squared plus a1 lambda naught plus a naught. What kind of bracket do I have? Square bracket. I think so. This looks like a square bracket to me. Okay. What do we want to show? We want to show that this y naught solves the homogeneous equation. So we want to show that when we put it into the left hand side, we get zero. So how do we argue that the outcome is zero? Well, we definitely don't get zero from the exponential. No way. So we have to argue somewhere here that we are getting zero. Well, what is this thing? This is the number L naught substituted into lambda to power n plus a n minus 1, lambda n, to, uh, n minus 1, and so on, plus a1 lambda plus a naught. This is a polynomial. What kind of polynomial is it? This is the characteristic polynomial of our equation, the equation star. What happens when you take lambda naught and substitute it into characteristic polynomial? Well, lambda naught is a characteristic number. And what is a characteristic number? A characteristic number is a root of a characteristic polynomial. In other words, when you take a characteristic number, substitute it into characteristic polynomial, you must get zero. And that's exactly it. So the proof is simple, but the argument here, the reasoning, requires a little bit of thinking. Okay? So one has to put all the information together in the right way. The algebra is easy. But here, this is the place where one has to sort of stop and think about the pieces of data that are there and how to arrange them together in an efficient way so that it's obvious that this really must be zero. Okay? So the right argument is we are taking characteristic number and substituting into a characteristic polynomial. That's why it must be zero. Here we go. By the way, this proof is really nice. So that's another of those that I like to ask about when it comes to oral exam. Just dropping a hint, okay? So let's go back to our topic. Now we know that using characteristic numbers, we can generate solutions. The next statement is equally important. When we take characteristic numbers, which are distinct, then the corresponding exponentials are linearly independent. And this part is not all that easy, but it can be done using the Ronsky matrix, the Ronsky determinant. Uh, you simply substitute into it those uh, exponentials when you are making those derivatives, then those coefficients jump out, you factor exponentials out, and then it's just a question for linear algebra, really. It's not about functions, it's about linear algebra, because after you pull out those exponentials, it will be just a matrix with numbers, not with functions. And people in linear algebra, they studied matrices like that, and they know that they are regular. The determinant is not zero. So this all essentially again follows from linear algebra. They are really helping us out really, really in this chapter a lot. So this is the key fact for solving differential equations. How do you do it? Well, you have a differential equation. It has order n. So you're looking for n functions. Where do you get them? Your differential equation has order n. When you pass, to a characteristic polynomial, then this characteristic polynomial will have degree equal to n, if this is order n. Because it's a polynomial of degree n, it should have n characteristic numbers. 
and roots, and from these guys you get those exponentials. So it seems that for ordinary differential equation of order n, you are getting n exponentials that are linearly independent, and therefore they should form a basis. And if you get lucky, in the nice cases, this is really true. This is how it works, and that's essentially it. That's how we solve linear differential equations that are homogeneous with constant coefficients. Can something go wrong? The answer is yes, the word distinct. That's a key word. It could happen that you have those roots of your polynomial, but they are not distinct. Some of them are of higher multiplicity. And then you are in trouble. Let's have a look at an example. Here we go, a differential equation over here and some initial conditions over here. So this is actually the initial value problem or a Cauchy problem. Let's see, does it make sense? Order four, one, two, three, four initial conditions. So it does make sense. And by the way, four conditions means the latest derivative, the largest derivative is three. Yeah, it all fits. So how do we solve this? Well, in order to find a particular solution, first we need to find a general solution. So that would be stage one. And to find the general solution, we want to use our new tricks. Are we allowed to use them? Well, let's see. This is a linear differential equation, definitely. It's homogeneous. And the coefficients, they are constant. So we can use our tricks. We pass to a characteristic polynomial. Let's see. Fourth derivative means fourth power minus three. Second derivative means square power and plus two. First derivative means power one. And that's it. One has to be careful, because when you get used to putting powers, you could write lambda to 4 minus 3 lambda cubed plus 2 lambda squared, and you are in trouble. Okay, So be careful. OK, how do we find the roots here? Well, we are lucky, extremely lucky, because we can factor out lambda. And then it's lambda cubed minus 3 lambda plus 2 is equal to 0. And we are getting 1 lambda, namely 0. Wonderful. So let's repeat our question. How do we find roots of the cubic polynomial? That's a very good question. So let's go back in our mind to linear algebra. What kind of trick were you using to solve high degree polynomials? What is the favorite way? Well, yes, we simply guess them. For school problems, this is the most efficient way because school problems are expected to have nice answers. So let's see. Zero is a nice number. It will not work because now the absolute term is not zero. Here it was zero. That's why zero worked. Another nice number. Let's say one. One is a nice number. Let's see. One minus three plus two is a zero. One is a root. So we have another one. Lambda equal to one. Aren't we lucky? Wow, wonderful. OK, what is left? Let's see. Uh, OK, there should be a polynomial of degree 2, a quadratic polynomial. Uh, well, you can try out your Horn scheme that you know from linear algebra. Finally, you have some use for it. Uh, you could try long division, dividing one polynomial by another. My favorite way is to more or less guess it. So to get lambda cubed, I have to have lambda square here. To get plus 2 with minus 1 here, I have to add negative 2 here. Now it works. And I have to fix the middle part so that the middle part fits. Let's see, how about lambdas? Lambdas. How many lambdas do I have? I have negative two lambdas, and I need negative three, so I have to put plus lambda here. With this minus, it will give another lambda. Subtract it. Yeah, I think so. Let's check. Lambda cubed minus lambda square plus lambda square disappears. Minus lambda, minus two lambda is minus three lambda, plus two, yeah, it works. Perhaps Horner scheme would be faster. Uh, okay, that's life. Anyway, this is a quadratic polynomial. We can find the roots easily. You can use, for instance, the discriminant formula, you know, square root of b squared minus four ic or what somebody sees there, anyway. Uh, again, I will try to factor because I'm optimistic that this is a school problem. And Actually, I created it, so yeah, I know that it, it will be nice. So here we go, lambda, lambda. I need to get negative two, so I put one to here. I need to get plus here, plus minus. Does it work? Lambda square my, uh, plus lambda minus two. Yeah, it does work. So two more lambdas, one and negative two.
I forgot equality sign. Okay, so let's wrap it up. One, two, three, four lambdas for polynomial of degree four for fourth order differential equation. Yeah, it does work. So our lambdas are zero, one, which is double, and negative two. So far, so good. Now, for each lambda, we are supposed to create an exponential. e2, 0 times x, e2, 1 times x, e2, negative 2 times x. And using these exponentials, we are supposed to compose a fundamental system. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Some students on a test would say, OK, e to 0x is actually just 1. e to 1x is e to x. e to negative 2x. And that's it. This is obviously wrong. Why? Because we have a differential equation of order 4. So the fundamental system has to have four elements in it, four vectors. This is a four-dimensional system. This describes some physical system or some natural phenomenon which has four degrees of freedom. We need them here, and we have just three. So this is wrong on fundamental level. Some students, they realize that they need four functions. And they say, OK, because one is the root of multiplicity two, I just put the exponential twice. This also does not work because this set is no longer linearly independent. These guys are depending on each other. One of them is exactly the same as the others. And of course, this cannot be a basis. Again, this is wrong on fundamental level. After all, what happens if you compose a general solution? You take one, multiply it by A. You take this guy, multiply it by B. This guy, multiply it by C. And this guy, multiply it by D. But now you look at it and you say, OK, these two guys, I can factor out the exponential. And I can see that, in fact, I do not have two degrees of freedom here. This is just one constant. I have just three degrees of freedom. One, two, three. Not enough. So this is really wrong. So when you are at the exam, be careful. Always check your fundamentals. Here we go. What should we do to fix this situation? The answer is, if you don't know what to do, you click. There we go. So here is our fact. We have a homogeneous linear differential equation with constant coefficients. That's exactly our case here. And we have characteristic number with multiplicity m, where m is assumed to be larger than 1, otherwise it's easy. What they say is that we should take the exponential, the one that we have here, e2x, and then we should take this exponential multiplied by x, and then multiplied by x squared and x cubed and so on, until we get enough exponentials to fill in the whole dimensions that we need. This one here is a double root, and therefore it stands for two dimensions. So we need two functions, and here I can see two functions, e to lambda x and x e to lambda x, and that would be enough. If I had eigenvalue or characteristic number of multiplicity 5, then I would need five functions into my fundamental system, and I would go and I would stop at x to power 4, e to lambda x. Okay, so it works like that, sort of logically. So let's see what's the proper way. For 0, I just get the constant function 1, then I get e to x, and I get x times e to x. So that's for lambda equal to 1, which is double. And finally, e to negative 2x. And that's the fundamental system. OK, so this is an important trick that you should remember for the exam, definitely. And once we have the fundamental system, the rest is easy and difficult at the same time. We will see. General solution. yx is equal to a times, uh, a times 1, so it's just a, plus b times uh, e to x, plus c times x e to x, plus d times e to negative 2x. x belonging to real numbers. With all our solutions, we have to put the region of validity. Shouldn't forget. OK, we have our general solution, which is the key. But we are not done yet. That was step one, finding general solution. Step two, 
initial conditions. So I need to figure out how to set up constants A, B, C, and D so that when I substitute zero into all these functions and derivatives, I get the prescribed outcomes. If I want to know how to do that, I need to know the derivatives so that I know what to you know, work with. So I will differentiate derivative. Let's see. Here, derivative is zero. Here, derivative is b e to x. So far, so good. Here, c times, and I differentiate. That's a product rule. Um, perhaps I will do it somewhere on the side. I differentiate the first guy. Then I copy the first and differentiate the second. And then I can factor out the exponential. It will be x plus 1 times e to x. So far, so good. I differentiate this guy. Negative 2 drops down d e to negative 2x. So that's the first derivative, second derivative. OK, um, well, b e to x, and also the third derivative, because I will also need a third derivative. Yeah. OK, let's see here. c. Now I differentiate the bracket, and it disappears, so it will be just e to x. And then I keep the bracket, and I differentiate the exponential, and then I pull out the exponential, and I will get x plus 2 e to x. And when I differentiate again, I will get x plus 3 e to x. Now, here, I take derivative, negative 2 drops down, and I differentiate negative 2 drops down, and I forgot d. Okay, I'm getting tired of this. Okay, so would I ask a problem like that on a test? The answer is definitely no. Uh, it's not difficult. I mean, it's easy, but it's long. Okay, so on the test, you can expect differential equation of order two or order three, and that's it. And if it's order three, you will definitely be able to guess some nice roots. I promise. Okay, uh, so this is like a punishment uh, that I'm dealing out to myself for being so bad and giving you some exams. Okay, uh, here we go. I have my derivatives. Now, what do I want? I'm looking for coefficients a, b, c, and d so that when I put 0 into y, y derivative, and so on, I will get a specific outcome. So what do I really want? I want that if I put 0 here, I get 3. So what I want is that a plus, I put 0 here, plus b, I put 0 here, plus nothing. I put 0 here, plus d, yields 3. This is what I want. When I put 0 into the derivative, I should get negative 6. So I'm putting 0 here, and I'm get putting 0 here and here, and I get just b's. a disappears. So b, b, b. I'm putting 0 here and here. Exponential will be 1. And here, x disappears, and I will get just c, 2c, 3c. c, 2c, 3c. OK. I'm putting 0 here, exponential disappears, and I'm getting negative 2d plus 4d minus 8d. And the outcomes are negative 6, 13, that's a nice number, and negative 22. OK. Now, this is how you deal with initial conditions. If you remember, this is how we did it for differential equation of order 1. We just substituted initial condition into the general solution, and we got A or C or whatever constant that we had. Here, the problem is that we have many requirements, so we have to substitute into also those derivatives, and we get a system of equations. Four variables and four initial conditions. Again, these things fit together. It's a 4 by 4 system. It is solvable. How do I know? The trick is that we are actually here substituting into derivatives. So this, is, this has something to do with the uh, Ronsky determinant. The Ronsky determinant cannot be zero, so the determinant of this cannot be zero. I talked about it a little bit. I hinted. I'm hinting again. There is some deep underlying theory. So we always should be able to figure out solution. If we do not get a solution, a unique solution. And it means that we made a mistake somewhere around here on the way. Perhaps already here, when we are setting up the fundamental system and didn't get enough functions, perhaps. 
this would we, we would recognize over here at this stage definitely anyway okay uh, did i punish myself enough i feel like like giving up but uh, okay let me work it out okay i see a 3 by 3 subsystem which i can solve individually separately uh, and then figure out a uh, if i subtract the second equation from these two guys then b disappears and i get a 2 by 2 system that looks good that looks inviting so i take equation 3 and i subtract equation number 2 and i get equation number 4 and subtract equation number 2 what do i get 3 minus 2 b is gone c will be here just once and i'm taking this subtracting this plus 6d and i'm taking this and subtracting this and i get 19 which is a prime and a rather large one well we will see. This is a school problem, so again, I expect nice answers. Uh, if they are not nice, perhaps I've made a mistake somewhere. I hope not. Okay, number four, subtracting number two. Subtracting, this is gone. Subtracting, I can see two Cs. Subtracting, I can see negative six Ds. Uh, yes. And I'm subtracting, and I can see when I'm subtracting, I'm actually adding six, I can see negative 16. Okay, so far so good. Now, if I take the second equation and subtract it twice from the, well, formally this one. So if I take the first equation, subtract it twice from the next one, C is gone. And what I get is, by 2 is 12, negative 18D. Now it's getting interesting. Uh, by 2 is 38, and I'm subtracting 38, this is 54 minus 54 and d is therefore uh, let me see three uh, let me see three by eight is 24 two uh, three five yeah it works i got an integer and a small integer which fills me with hope yeah this could be it now let's see from this equation c is c is 19 minus 6d which is one so far, so good. From, from, from this equation, how much is B? Let's see. D is 3, so negative 6, negative 6 cancels. I take C and move it to the right, and I get negative 1. And finally, I'm getting A. This is a nice domino. I love that. OK, uh, never mind. 3 here, 3 here cancels, b moves to the other side, I get a equal to 1. So, if I didn't make a mistake, and this looks good, the particle solution should be, let's see, a is 1, what is a? Here, y, general solution, a is 1, minus e to x, plus x e to x, plus 3 e to negative 2 x, and again, I should remember, always put the region of validity. What I really hate when a student does all the calculations correctly and in the first problem forgets about the region, second problem forgets about the region. Each time you lose one point and if you do it in three problems in a row, three points down, it will hurt. Okay? So please try to make me happy and write those regions of validity. Okay? Make it a habit. Okay, uh, is that it? Initial conditions worked out? Yeah, that's it. So I solved the problem. What did we learn? First of all, we learned the trick for lambdas of higher multiplicity. Very useful. You will need it with high probability. I would say about every third problem has this multiplicity, higher multiplicity in the fundamental system. We also learned an important thing, which is the structure, how we solve initial value problems for linear equations. How do we do it? First, we find a general solution using lambdas, essentially, characteristic numbers, exponentials, very easy. And then there comes the second stage, initial conditions, which are done in the, let's say, intuitive way, in the natural way. You figure out the derivatives that you need, you substitute your point into them, and you ask what you want from those derivatives, and you get some answer, okay? So that's it. Is there something, anything left that we have to investigate? The answer is uh, yes. Let's have a look at another example. Here is our last example. And you can see there are no initial conditions. By the way, there, there would have to be three of them. 
So it means, okay, what are we asking about? Most likely the general solution. That's our question. So it means that we just do the first stage of what we saw before of that complicated procedure. We just pass to lambdas, figure out eigenvalues, and we are done. Wow, that should be easy. Lambda cubed plus lambda square plus lambda plus one is zero. That's the characteristic equation. Uh, okay, it's a polynomial of degree three, so I promise there should be some nice roots. How about one? Uh, okay, one doesn't work. How about negative one? Uh, negative one, yeah, it works. So one lambda is negative one, and therefore we can write this as lambda plus one times some quadratic polynomial. What kind of polynomial is it? Well, let's see. We need lambda square over here. We need one over here. And to fill it in, uh, well, we are actually done. It's just like that. So that's very nice. So we ask for the root here. And this is quite obvious. Lambda should be plus or minus i, which is the complex unit. So we have one, two, three characteristic numbers, which fits degree three of the polynomial or of the equation. And therefore, if I make a list, we can set up three exponentials and form a general solution. Y x is equal to a times. An exponential based on negative one is simply e to minus x, plus b times e to i x, plus c times e to negative i x, x belonging to real numbers. Is this a solution? The answer is uh, yes, because the theorem about lambda actually worked also for complex lambdas. You check the proof and it also works for complex numbers. So formally, this is okay. But the problem is that our differential equation is not given with complex numbers. It's a real-world differential equation. And we therefore expect to see a real-world solution, not a complex world solution. So we would really, really love to get rid of those i's in some way. Uh, this is definitely not what we want. How do we do it? Well, there's actually two interesting viewpoints. And I'll show the one which is, let's say, more useful for differential equations. Uh, let's have a little trip over here. I have y, which solves differential equation. y and derivative plus summation, sum coefficient, decayth derivative is equal to zero. Or even it's equal to bx, which is real. Now, I don't really care whether the equation is homogeneous or not. What I'm going to show works in both cases. So y is a solution, and perhaps it may involve some complex numbers. I don't really know. This is equality of two objects, real-valued objects, or even complex objects. So when I apply real part as an operator operation, I should get equality again. The real, the real part, real part of this number must be the same as the real part of this number or this number. Okay? So I'm taking real part of 0, which is 0, or perhaps real part of b, which is again b. I said it's a real function. And now I'm going to apply the real part to the left-hand side. Now the real part as operation satisfies all kinds of rules. For instance, it passes to the individual uh, summons, individual parts in summation. Therefore, I can put it here and also here. And I can also pu pull it inside the summation. And when I multiply, I simply apply it to each part separately. So I'm actually getting real part of the nth derivative plus summation, real part of ak, real part of the kth derivative, and this all should be 0 or bx, depending on which kind of equation you are solving. Now, the trick is, OK, ak, these are real coefficients. Our equation lives in the world of real numbers, real numbers over here. So real part of ak is just ak. and this is not perhaps generally known to freshmen, but real part as an operation passes also inside the derivative. So it's real part of the function y power n, uh, or rather nth derivative, sorry, I should be careful, ak, and now real part of y 
differentiated k times, and this is zero or bx, depending on how you want to play it. So assuming that y solves my differential equation, it turns out that the real part of y also solves it. And the same is true for the imaginary part. I can apply the same trick. I, apply, I look for the imaginary part. I push it through to the inside next to the y so that it applies to it directly. These guys are solutions. So that's a general observation. Now, how does it help us? Imagine that you get lambda, which is complex. So it has a real part. It has imaginary part. And you're looking at this exponential with complex lambda, just like you're looking at it here, and you're thinking, OK, that's a complex solution. What happens if I take the real part and the imaginary part? Well, let's have a look at this again. This is e to alpha x e to beta i x. That's a real number. And this is a purely complex number here in the, uh, exponent, in the exponent. And for that, we have a trick. This is called the trigonometric form of a complex number, or something like that. It's been a while since I was in high school. So I knew the terminology then, and now I know what I'm doing. So uh, these are two different things, perhaps. OK. Uh, to write down this using trigonometric functions, I simply take cosine beta x plus i sine beta x. And I split it again. This is e to alpha x cosine beta x plus i e to alpha x sine beta x. This is the imaginary part. This is the real part. That's why I was doing it, so that I can actually see the real part of this solution and the imaginary part of this solution. So what is the conclusion? That when lambda comes in the form alpha plus beta i, then I get two solutions out of it. One is e to alpha x cosine beta x, and the other one is e to alpha x sine beta x. Now, the trick is that these two guys are really independent. So they give me two dimensions in my fundamental system, and they are real functions, exactly what I've been looking for. Now you may say, OK, wait a second, wait a second. There is one lambda, and you get two dimensions in the fundamental system. Isn't there, you know, wrong? Well, let's remember, our original equation had constant coefficients which were real numbers. This is a differential equation that lives in the world of real numbers, and therefore the characteristic polynomial also has real valued coefficients, and therefore for every complex, every complex root, there is another guy, which is the conjugate. And now if you apply exactly this type of tricks to alpha minus beta i, then this minus essentially appears here at this place, and it can be pulled out. Cosine is an even function, so this minus disappears. And with sine function, it's an odd function. You can pull it out here, outside of this uh, part, and it does not really interfere. So you get exactly the same two functions. So when you are solving linear differential equations, which is a real world, real uh, domain differential equation, then you should be getting those complex lambdas coming in pairs. So actually expecting two dimensions out of this pair of complex uh, characteristic numbers. And you are getting a two-dimensional two-dimensional set for a fundamental system. So it does work together. Okay? I promise that there are two ways, so just out of curiosity, from linear algebra. Here we are actually having two vectors, complex exponentials, which are seen as vectors in the world of functions. Uh, so one of them has plus in the middle, and the other guy has minus in the middle. That's the only difference between the two functions that we get from those two exponentials. In linear algebra, there is a th theorem which allows you to take a basis and replace it with some other basis, which is created by playing with x1 and x2. So if this is your basis, then you can take the sum of these two guys, or you can take x1 minus x2, and what you get is a new basis. And if you feel that these vectors are too long, you divide them by 2. So you can take 1 half of x1 plus x2, and you, think you can take 1 half of x1 
minus x2. So what happens when you have two vectors in your fundamental system? One looks like this, and the other one has minus in the middle. Well, you sum them up. This disappears. You divide by two, and you get this guy. You subtract. The cosine part disappears. You have this guy twice, so you divide by two. You divide also by i, and you get the sine part. Okay, so there's also a little bit to it with linear algebra, a little coincidence, let's say, or a little relationship. But for us, this is a much more useful observation that when you have a complex solution of your differential equation, you take real part, you take imaginary part, you get solutions. This will be hand, handy uh, a few weeks in the future. Okay, so let's not leave it. This is really something that, that we should keep in mind when it comes to differential equations. Let's go back to our problem here. So I have lambda equal to negative 1, which is OK. And then I have lambda equal to plus or minus i. And let's write it properly. We get e to i x. And there is no real part over here, no real part for this lambda. So this translates directly into cosine x plus i sine x. And I take the real part, I take the imaginary part. Or I simply remember this scheme, that when you have a complex eigenvalue, you use alpha, the real part, to create exponential. And because there is no real part, I'm not creating any exponentials. And you use the beta, the complex part, complex component of your, complex, uh, of your eigenvalue, and you use it to create cosines and sines. This gives you the frequency for those two guys. So I can actually directly, if I just remember it, say, OK, no real part, so no exponential. And here the coefficient is 1, so it will be cosine x and sine x. These are the guys for my fundamental system. One, two, three guys for the fundamental system. Here we go. Fundamental system, e to negative x, cosine x, sine x. How many? One, two, three. Third order for my ODE, this fits. Are they independent? The answer is uh, yes. You can try the uh, Ronsky matrix, Ronsky determinant. Yeah, this is not a really problem. And finally, general solution. So the general solution is a times e to negative x plus b times cosine x plus c times sine x, x belonging to real numbers. Again, let me remind you to put the region of validity. And that's it. My problem is solved. So we should remember the scheme for complex eigen, uh, well, complex characteristic numbers. Some people also call them eigen numbers, but it's more common to call them characteristic numbers. From real part, you get exponential. For complex part, cosine, sine. Notice that if your characteristic number is just real, you take this and you create exponential. Here, you take this, you create exponential. So there is a common ground. So. Do we have it all? Do we know how to do everything? The answer is, uh, OK, what if we have a complex characteristic number which has higher multiplicity? And the answer is, well, you do this trick with cosine, with sine, and then you start putting x in front of it until you have enough functions. And all these guys will be still linearly independent. OK, the last slide for today. Here we go. We have a homogeneous linear ODE with constant coefficients, and we have some characteristic numbers. Now, if this characteristic number is real, that's part one, and it has some multiplicity, then we create this chain of exponentials. We start with just the exponential, then we multiply it by x, by x squared, and so on, until we get enough. Okay? If this eigenvalue is complex, then we look at the real part, we look at the imaginary part, and we use the real part to set up exponential, and we use the imaginary part to set up cosine or sine. And if there is higher multiplicity, we take these basic two guys and we start multiplying them by x and so on. In this way, we generate a list of functions. And the statement 3 says that the functions that we get at the end, when we put all those different functions coming from different lambdas, when we put all of them together in one heap, it will be a fundamental system. So finally, we have it all licked. Good news. 
And that's essentially it, uh, with one exception. Let me talk about one question that I like to ask. So let's make some room and recall the previous examples. So in this list, we have solutions that we obtained in those examples that we did in today's lecture. And I will now ask a slightly different question. For instance, we have here a particular solution, and typically we would ask how it looks like in a specific interval. But sometimes we are interested in long-term development. And then we are essentially, mathematically speaking, asking about the behavior when x goes to infinity. Typically, we ask questions like that when we are talking about the limit. So we actually have the tools at hand, we just need to use them properly. So, I have an expression here, and I'm asking, what is happening when x is really, really huge? And the answer is, well, this is a linear combination of some terms, so I'm going to compare them. How do they behave near infinity? Well, e to negative 2x near infinity is a zero, it goes to zero. And there are some terms that do not go to zero, for instance, the term 1. So this term is negligible compared to 1 eventually, and I can ignore it. Let's have a look at another term over here, e to x. This goes to infinity, and it's compared to 1. So of course it wins, and therefore also 1 is insignificant. It's negligible, and we can discard it from our considerations. So eventually we have two candidates for the so-called uh, dominant term. In other words, we have to decide who's the boss in this expression. There is e to x, and there is x times e to x. Now, x times e to x is x times larger than this guy. And x is a really huge number. So I can think that this expression, whatever it is, is almost infinitely many times larger than this expression, and therefore it totally overwhelms it. This guy is negligible compared to this one, which is actually quite good, because this guy goes to infinity, this guy also goes to infinity, but this one has minus in front of it. So there are two infinities pulling in opposite directions, and therefore, normally, we couldn't say which one actually wins. It may be possible that they are both equally strong, but not in this case. Fortunately, this guy is the winner. We are going to discard also this one. And therefore, this tells us that the solution goes to infinity, as time goes to infinity. That's a very useful information. Sometimes, when we are investigating the behavior of a system, we may be actually worrying about something going to infinity, so if we see something like that, we know that we are in trouble. Or perhaps we wanted that. Either way, this could be a very useful information. But in fact, we want to know more. Okay, so this solution goes to infinity, but how fast? This can be also very important in applications. Well, since we discarded terms that are not really important, we can say, that the solution yx behaves like x e to x when x goes to infinity. This is actually a mathematical notion. This is called asymptotic rate of growth. So we could also say that this solution grows asymptotically near infinity like the function x e to x. And it's also practical. Remember, numerical mathematics, we are trying to evaluate things. Let's say that x is a million. You want to know how much is the solution when time is a million. Well, you could try to substitute into this formula, and actually it's a good idea if you try it. Pick up your calculator, punch in some numbers, and figure out how much is this. And then you take a million and you put it into this formula, and you will find that these two answers are essentially identical. There is a very tiny difference. So you can actually replace this complicated formula with a simple formula, near infinity for large numbers, and that's very practical. Now, typically, actually, we are not asking about one particular solution, but we are asking about all solutions, because we have some system, and we want to know how it behaves. We want to know what to expect from the system. So we find a general solution, and that's exactly the solution that we found, and from that we draw this particular one. And we can ask, OK, what happens with this general solution when x goes to infinity? So we are actually asking about behavior near infinity. That's our question. And here we actually have the same factors. 
So we know that this guy is negligible, this guy goes to zero, and there are two infinities that are competing, but it becomes difficult. You may say, okay, here's the boss, but what if C is zero? If C is zero, then E to X gets promoted to the boss position. So this is tricky, we actually cannot give a, a one unique answer to the question, how does it behave? Which is unpleasant, but in fact we do not really need it, because the case when C is zero is very rare. The probability that this happens is zero. So we're going to take a typical solution, let me add the word here, and now it's the proper question. We are asking about typical behavior near infinity. In typical case, A, B, C, and D are not zero, so all the terms are in play, and you just compare and you see which one is the winner. And therefore, we can conclude our analysis by saying that the typical solution has asymptotic rate of growth equal to C times X times E to X for X near infinity. That's another notation. I'm not really big on notation here, the important thing is the message, okay? So formally, we talk here about asymptotic growth, but we can also say why x behaves like this near infinity. Okay, let's try our trick on another solution. This was the general solution of the very first example of today's lecture. Okay, let's have a look. One factor, another factor, two exponentials. They both go to infinity, and because we're asking about a typical solution, a is not zero, b is not zero. So two infinities competing, and we know that e to 2x goes to infinity much faster than e to x. Again, this is something that we learn in calculus. So we can conclude that the asymptotic rate of growth of this solution is b e to 2x, as x is near infinity. We also had this solution, but before we get to it, let me skip it. Let's look at this one. We didn't have it, it's just a slight modification, but it's useful. Okay, what do I see here? I see exponential, which goes to infinity. And I see cosine and sine, these are bounded functions. If you take bounded functions, they oscillate between negative one and one, and multiply them by some constants, you still get bounded oscillations. You sum them up, you get something which is still bounded. And now there are two parts. One of them is bounded, so as you go with time to infinity, there are bounds, and this part somehow moves in between, while this guy shoots to infinity. Well, of course it wins. That's the boss here. So yx behaves like a e to x as x is near infinity. Which brings us to this part. What's happening here? Well, e to negative x, this guy goes to zero. So you may think, okay, perhaps it's negligible, but there is a combination of sines and cosines, and we note individually, each of these guys can actually be sometimes zero. In fact, very often it can be zero, infinitely many times. And if it happens that the whole group is zero, then this little tiny exponential suddenly becomes the big guy. Or perhaps sometimes this is a big number, when cosine is one, sine is something, and there is a big number here, and this is already small, so then this guy becomes the boss. Or perhaps this one, when sine is equal to one, cosine is equal to zero, and this is almost zero. You can see that there are all kinds of mixed signals being sent. So before we actually try to form some conclusion, uh, let's get a better handle on this expression. That's an expression that we meet a lot in differential equations of order two, and these are very useful in applications. Uh, I will be talking about them in a special video on applications. So typically the solution that you get is a combination of cosine with some frequency, beta, and sine with some frequency, beta. In our example, the complex unit appeared just once in lambda, in the characteristic number, that's why there is one here, one here, but in general there can be some beta. Now, this expression can be written in a better way, in a more convenient way, or more practical way, using a trick. What kind of a trick? Well, I'm going to replace b with a sine of some angle. And then there's this cosine beta x and I replace C with some A cosine 
of some angle. The same angle here, phi phi. Is that possible? Let's have a look at it. We actually have two equations. A cosine phi is C, A sine phi is B. These are actually equations for pole coordinates. If we imagine that C and B are coordinates, the usual rectangular coordinates, the Cartesian coordinates of some point, then these would be A and phi would be the polar coordinates. So we know that actually there must be A and phi that satisfy this set of conditions. Just out of curiosity, if I take the second equation and divide it by the first equation, I get tangent phi is B over C. So this determines the angle, but not uniquely, because we know the tangent is periodic. And here we need to have the full range of angles between 0 and 2 pi, or 0 and 360, depending how you see it. In analysis, we prefer radians. Okay? So one has to also worry a little bit about signs. So passing to pole coordinates is, is not exactly easy. One has to do a little bit more than just substitute into a formula. But that's something that we don't have to worry about here all that much. Uh, let me square each of these equations. I get a square. Cosine square phi is c square, and a square sine square phi is b square. If I sum them up and I factor out a square, I get cosine square plus sine square, which is 1, so it's a square times 1, is equal to b square plus c square, and therefore a is square root b square plus c square, like a Pythagoras formula. So a can be calculated rather easily. It's the angle which is a little bit troublesome, but not much. Anyway, why did we do it? Well, we can factor out capital A. And for this expression, there is a formula, trick identity, which tells us that this is actually sine beta x plus phi. So what did we just learn? We have a cosine wave which is actually multiplied by some constant b. And we have sine wave with the same frequency, that's important, which is multiplied by some constant c, which can be perhaps even negative. So let me put sine here multiplied by a negative constant over here. And now these two guys are added. So imagine that when you add them, you get something periodic. This is sort of like obvious, but the shape is not clear. It could be something like that, for all we know. However, this trick with calculations with polar coordinates, essentially, has shown us that actually the signal is very nice. This is just a sine wave with the same frequency, shifted to the left or to the right, depending on the sine of phi, and multiplied by some amplitude. So this picture is not correct. This is not what's happening. When you compose sine and cosine with equal frequency, then the outcome is just a sine wave, perhaps shifted a bit. So that's the shape of the signal that we can see over here at this part. This is actually very useful in electric theory, uh, electric circuits theory where they uh, solve differential equations and they see the signal, electrical signal, which is passing through the circuit, and it very often has this shape. Okay, so this is a useful trick, but uh, in this course we are not going to be really big on it. Anyway, here we have a wave, which is a sine wave, essentially. Shifted, perhaps enlarged by some amplitude, A, whatever. So this is a sine wave composed with exponential. So, of course, if this is a sine wave, that then sometimes it is a zero. This whole group is a zero, and then the exponential is the boss. It's small, but much bigger than zero. Even a small number is much bigger than zero. But at other moments, we are at the top of this sine wave, and the exponential is small. So there are really two competing guys. Sometimes one wins, sometimes the other. There is no clear dominancy. And therefore, we are unable to replace our solution with one expression. So, essentially, no answer here. If somebody asks us, how does this solution behave, typical solution here, you would say, well, it behaves like, like this, like itself, 
I cannot give a simplified answer. So on a test, I wouldn't ask a question like that, essentially, because this is boring. I want to see how you do the analysis of terms and things like that. So I would ask reasonable questions. But it's good to be aware of the fact that sometimes you simply cannot decide. So that's it for uh, the main part of the lecture. And now, if you are curious, there will be a bonus. And actually, students who are interested in A, in the A grade, they should be curious, because there is one important fact that I didn't prove. The fact about uh, eigenvalues of higher multiplicity. How do we get the solutions from them? We used it, but perhaps we do not trust them because we didn't see the proof. Uh, I can ask about the proof when you come to oral exam and you need a really a lot of points, so it's one of those marginal proofs. Uh, but it's interesting because it combines uh, information from several sources, so I'm going to show it as a bonus. And if you want to stick around, I think it will be nice. Here we go. We have a linear differential equation the nth derivative plus a n minus 1, the n minus first derivative. It has constant coefficients to make our lives easier. And finally, a1 y derivative plus a naught y, and it's a homogeneous equation. Here we go. Now, we create characteristic polynomial, p lambda, which is obtained simply by replacing derivatives with powers. And so on. And then we find roots. And one of them is lambda naught. And the multiplicity is at least two. We know that we have a solution. Namely, e to lambda naught x coming out of this lambda naught, out of this characteristic number. But in the statement, it also says that x times this exponential is a solution. And this is what we don't know yet. So is it a solution or not? Well, let's substitute into the left-hand side of our equation. What do we get? Well, we get the nth derivative of lambda of x, e to lambda x, plus a n minus 1, x e to lambda not x, the n minus first derivative, plus and so on, plus a1, x e to lambda not x derivative, plus a not, x e to lambda not x. <sighs> okay, let's see. We have all those derivatives, so we need to figure them out. That's the key. Okay, e lambda not x is multiplied by x. That's obvious. What do we get when we take derivative? Using the product rule, it will be e to lambda not x plus x lambda not e to lambda not x. So far, so good. That's the first derivative. Let's take another derivative. So by taking the derivative here, I get lambda naught e to lambda naught x. And here we have to use the product rule again. We differentiate x and we get lambda naught e to lambda naught x plus x lambda naught squared e to lambda naught x. How much is it? This is actually 2 lambda naught e to lambda naught x plus x lambda naught squared e to lambda naught x. Okay, that was the second derivative, by the way. k is equal to 2. This is the first derivative, k is equal to 1. Let's differentiate once more. We take derivative, we get 2 lambda naught squared e to lambda naught x plus product rule lambda naught squared e to lambda naught x, that was the derivative of x, plus we keep x. And we take derivative here, lambda naught cubed e to lambda naught x. Perhaps I should have used lambda instead of lambda naught. This is really getting boring. OK, let's simplify it. Lambda squared exponential is here three times. 3 lambda naught squared e to lambda naught x plus x lambda naught cubed e to lambda naught x. And this is derivative when k is equal to 3. Do we see a pattern, especially when we compare it like that? Well, I definitely see lambda naught cubed, lambda naught squared, 
and this corresponds to k. And the constant corresponds to k. And also I can see it here. There's number one here for the derivative. So this seems to work. Uh, it seems hopeful. Also the power here grows. There is no power, one power, square power. Let's try it once more. So we differentiate again and we get, okay, here I'm differentiating and lambda drops down. Three lambda not cubed, e to lambda not x. Here product rule, x is gone after differentiation plus x, and I differentiate the exponential, lambda naught to the power 4, e to lambda naught x. Okay, okay. I look at it and I say, wait a second, this looks like 4, lambda naught cubed, e to lambda naught x, plus x, lambda naught to the power 4, e to lambda naught x. <sighs> okay. This is for k equal to 4, and it seems to confirm our guess. 4 here, power which is smaller by one here and four here. So, let's make a guess over here. We think that the fourth derivative of our exponential of our function, kth derivative is k lambda naught to k minus one exponential plus x lambda naught to k exponential. This is what it seems to be. And you can prove by induction that this is true. Okay, let's go back here. The nth derivative according to the formula, should be n times lambda naught to n minus 1 e to lambda naught x plus x lambda naught to the power n e to lambda naught x. Perhaps I should introduce some notation for the exponential. It's getting really boring. Okay. Uh, let's stick with it. Uh, a n minus 1, the n minus first derivative. So, n minus 1, lambda naught to n minus 2 exponential plus x, lambda naught to n minus 1 exponential plus three dots, plus. Do I remember the pattern uh, correctly? The answer is, uh, it seems that yes. Okay, uh, to see things better, let me also include the second derivative term. So it will be a2 and the second derivative. Two lambda naught exponential plus x lambda naught squared exponential plus the a1 term. So uh, it will be just e2 lambda naught x plus x lambda naught exponential. Is that right? Uh, yes plus a naught times the function itself, x e to lambda naught x. Okay, uh, here we go. Now it gets interesting. We are going to pull out the exponential. We are getting rid of it, finally. Okay. And now there will be something left. And some of those terms have x with them and some do not. So obviously there are two things happening. Let's pull out the terms with x and we can also pull out this x out of them. So where do we see x? We see it over here, lambda naught to power n, and the exponential is gone. I should remember, exponential is gone. I took it out. Plus, here is x, and here is the coefficient. a n minus 1, I'm pulling out x. So it's lambda naught to n minus 1. Plus, we keep going, and we find x over here with coefficient a2, a2, and I pull out x, I pull out the exponential, lambda naught squared. Then, at this place, I can see x, so it's a1, lambda naught, and finally I can see x over here, and I put, pull out x and the exponential, and there is just a naught left. Okay, half of the work done here, plus. Let's see what's left. Exponential is gone. n lambda naught to n minus 1. OK. Uh, that's this part. a n minus 1 times n minus 1 lambda naught to n minus 2 plus and so on plus here a2, 2 lambda naught, 
plus A1, and that's it. <sighs> okay, and this is the moment where we should start arguing that this is actually zero, because we want to show that x e to lambda not x is a solution to the homogeneous equation. So how do I show that this is zero? Now, when we were showing that the exponential is a solution, we looked at the ex expression and we recognized the characteristic polynomial in it. And that's exactly what's over here, the part with axis. That's the characteristic polynomial. And into this characteristic polynomial, we actually substituted lambda naught, which is a root of this polynomial, and therefore this must be zero. So far, so good. How about this part? Is this the characteristic polynomial? The answer is no. But in fact, there is a connection between them. And perhaps, just imagine that it's lambda here, not lambda naught, just lambdas. And look at them, and perhaps you will see some connection. And perhaps you see this connection and you don't see the meaning or the, the usefulness of that connection. So let me give you a few hints. When r is a root of some function, it means that when you substitute it, you get zero. When r is a root of multiplicity two, then it means that you substitute, you get zero, and when you substitute into the derivative, you get also zero. When r is a root of multiplicity three, then you substitute into the function, get zero, you substitute into the derivative, get zero, and you substitute into the second derivative and get zero. Can you see the pattern? Yeah, this is from calculus, from mathematical analysis. And actually, Typically, students of our calculus are not told this because this is not like crucial or important enough, but it's true. That's actually how the multiplicity is defined, plus a little bit more. What's important for us is that lambda is a root of multiplicity at least two, so we know that when we put it into the derivative of characteristic polynomial, it must yield zero as well. Derivative of the characteristic polynomial. How does it look like? n times lambda to n minus one, a n minus one, n minus one, n minus two here. Everything fits. I take derivative here, a two, two lambda. A two, two lambda. I take derivative here, I get a one, and a naught disappears. A one, a naught disappears. This, in fact, is the derivative of characteristic polynomial with lambda in it, and it also must yield zero. Happy end. So that's how it is done for higher multiplicity lambdas. And if lambda is of multiplicity at least three, then you take x squared, e to lambda x, you substitute into your differential equation, and it starts getting really interesting when there's x squared here. So essentially, in the end, you get three brackets, three groups. One of them will be p, one of them will be p derivative, and the third group will be p second derivative and so on. So the general proof for multiplicity m uh, can be really tricky. I'm definitely not going to show it. I think that was enough. <sighs> so that's all for today's lecture. Thank you for surviving it. See you next time.